Welcome to our next talk about adapting Java for the serverless world. Before we start the talk, I have some administration infos for you. So first, uh, a big, huge thank you to all our sponsors who make this possible that we can do this, uh, all these talks and uh, this, the streaming, etc. We have a platinum sponsor, we have some uh, gold sponsors here. And of course, uh, don't forget all our silver sponsors. Without them, we could not do the, all these nice talks we are organizing here. We have a chat, or it's usually on the right side of your screen. The chat is for you. So all your attendees can talk and, and chat. And if you have some technical difficulties, you can write it there and I will help, etc. Use this chat for you. And if you have a question for the presenter, this is uh, Vadim today, then you can switch to the Q&A section and please write your question for the presenter there. And at the end of the talk, we will have a Q&A section where I will ask all the questions. In the meantime, you can read all questions which everyone is typing and you can vote on the questions. And we will start the Q&A with the questions with the most votes in it, of course. The stream has a slight delay of 10 to 15 seconds. We do this to optimize the experience and uh, make it possible that even if you don't have such a huge bandwidth, you can have a stable and a stream with a good quality. After the talk, uh, you are forwarded to a feedback form on our website of the Java user group. And uh, please wait for the forwarding and uh, please give us feedback about the speaker, about the topic, about the talk, etc. And uh, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And uh, we need feedback to see where we can uh, improve and what we can do better. This talk is recorded and uh, we need a few days and then we will publish this talk later on YouTube. So uh, be sure to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click on the small bell so you get a notification when we upload uh, new talks to our YouTube channel. And of course we have a Slack channel. So if you want to continue discussion, you can uh, just become a member of our Slack channel it's free, of course, and uh, there you can contact us, uh, talk to us, and uh, yeah, continue all the discussions. Okay, there we are. This was my introduction. Now I hand over to Vadim, and he has prepared some polls, which I will start in a few seconds here. And let's see, where do we have them? This is the first one. Do you have experience with AWS Cloud? Uh, the answers are coming in. Vadim, can you see the answers? Yeah, I can see the answers. Okay. It's a, a bit surprising currently. <laughs> that it's, um, uh, if you uh, don't see the answers, you can switch to the poll tab. It's uh, on the right side of the Q&A. Yes, I, I see the answers. So just, uh, yeah. Yeah. OK, let's. Continue with the next poll. We have three questions. So this is the second one. Do you have experience with serverless? Oh, the answers are coming in very fast. About 50% have no experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the two answers, serverless, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, and let's uh, go to the third and last question. In case you had previous experience with serverless, with which language? This is a multi-select. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Very interesting, Vadim, isn't it? Right, indeed it. Yeah. So just, I didn't expect to be quite honestly that not so much experience with AWS Cloud and even with serverless because it's not the basic talk about serverless and AWS Cloud, but just the results are, results are as they are. So I will try to make the best of it. Um, just, uh, but yes, that's that's a bit surprising, but just, yeah. So. Okay, me, I switch now to your screen. Is this okay? This is okay. I'm also in the full screen mode, so I've shared my screen. So now you see the, the title of the title page. Perfect. So just, then I will take over, so. Hello and welcome um, to my talk, Adopting Java for the Serverless World. And I will take the perspective of the AWS developer. So just um, to mention, my name is uh, Vadim, Vadim. I'm Ukrainian native, but uh, I live in Germany for the half of my life, which is 20 years. Um, so and work for the company called IPLabs in Bonn. And I'm one of the organizers of uh, Java user group Bonn and also serverless meetup one, so that with this talk, I will share my two passions, um, Java and serverless. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like, um, or just uh, we can connect on LinkedIn, or if you have questions where just, yeah, you can ask them later even uh, by email. Um, some words about the company. Uh, we uh, write, provide software for designing and purchasing of the photo products like calendars, photo books, uh, fun products. So everywhere you you can print your photo, so where you can save your memories, like the photo book of the year and so on. We are the 100% subsidiary of the Fujifilm Europe. And we are doing many things in, with LWS since more than three years, I would say. and. Um, did huge steps also with serverless uh, since two and a half years. So we have quite experience. Uh, we have a lot of Java developers. We also have, uh, have a lot of JavaScript developers. So just uh, we run, so a lot to talk about what, what challenges did, did we have with, with serverless with Java and why, because we have a, even a, this experience with LWS, I will take this perspective. I don't have any experience, any deep experience with other cloud providers or with Knative and other solutions. So many things we'll be talking about there. I think they are general for adoption of serverless and Java also for other cloud providers, but there will be things which are really special for AWS, how they solve or what solutions they provide. So I don't really know if there is any match outside of AWS cloud. And I saw that many people didn't have experience experience with AWS, so it's managing, but we'll try to explain just so that you will um, understand things. We can place over after, after the Q&A session. So um, then there's Java popularity, and uh, of course, we are Java user group, so we know that Java is very popular programming language, and just there are a lot of service surveys which can manifestate this but uh, they provide very difficult, uh, different results based on different criteria, like stack over four questions or job search and so on. But generally speaking, you see that Java is among top three and they're probably kind of market share uh, of 20% is what, what's probably the right one. If we then go to, uh, to the cloud services and, and serverless, you see that just there are a lot of dimension how you can vote for the cloud provider, but uh, Amazon, Web services is number one probably from 10 years in the most quadrant of this major quadrant of Gartner. So just uh, 
probably the most popular um, public cloud provider. When we look at the most popular um, serverless solutions, and in, in, the to in, 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 the, in the slides in the bottom, you see the link, so I will provide uh, then the slides so you can go to the service and, and look deeper. There are a lot of information there, but just the survey from this year uh, where the, the people were asked which serverless vendor do you use, and you see AWS Lambda as a function, as a service of serverless, uh, just yeah, with a huge yeah, distance, the number one, and so just AWS is number one, and people use uh, serverless um, services also from AWS. Um, so just very important topic, and you see the rise of serverless and other service, so we see the huge spike uh, adopting serverless, so trying to do proof of concept and so on in the last years. So serverless is definitely a uh, hot topic. So now we will switch to the Java serverless developer on AWS and see what uh, AWS offers. So what we have there is the Java 8 support with extended long-term support. So Amazon offers Amazon Coreto. This is similar to Adopt OpenGDK. So with uh, extended long-term support, and they even provide performance optimizations for Java, which uh, works well with Amazon uh, Linux operating system. So uh, a lot of improvements. So, um, and they also provide long-term support uh, for Java 11 since the end of the last year. And what they promise that they will only support the uh, long-term uh, version. So no Java 14, 15. So the next one will be after the release of Java 17. What I really know, if you have experience with other cloud providers, then this is a situation is in AWS is really, really good. Because I know that probably Google or Azure, they uh, supported Java 8 two years ago for the first time. Amazon did it in the end of 2015. So just the situation is, is, is pretty OK. So just not comparable to other cloud providers which favor other programming languages. And uh, what we know, we love Java, we are Java user group. So if you attend the talk, so you're probably one who is, yeah, who believes in Java, very much a very fast programming language. But if we would see that this serverless adoption, especially on AWS, just as the recent, the recent survey for uh, probably from the last month, and you see this is not harmonized. So you see if you, if you sum up all the percentages, it will be over 150. So you see that the Java is way beyond Node.js and Python. If you, if you will normalize this, we will end up something between 5 and 7%. And it's what I really see, that Java is way beyond. It will be, uh, we'll be talking about why. Also, another story that was for the last year with the similar result, what, 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 what they measured was the percentage of function and monitor. So how many functions were Java functions. This is the first number. And the second one, uh, the percentage of invocation monitored. So probably we will ignore the second number. And then you see Java adoption is around 6%. So once again, Node.js and Python both reading. So independent service, service confirmed the same picture. Java is very popular programming language, but its adoption uh, in the serverless world is kind of struggling. And just, yeah, we had, as developers love Java, we love the productivity and we invest in our developers and serverless is really hot topic. We will not discuss the benefits of serverless itself. Uh, I do other talks which are strictly connected to this. So the people see value there and um, they want to use this programming language. Uh, but what are the challenges? Why, why, why Java is struggling? And the first one is so-called Call start, and we will be talking um, about this. What does it mean in the context of LWS? But it will be similar to um, to other cloud providers. So just way back, how to create Lambda function with the Java as a runtime? So just a simple runtime. Choose your runtime now. With Java eight. You will also have Java um, eleven. And what you also choose? How much memory maximal uh, can your function consume? So this is between um, 128 megabytes and 3 gigabytes on LWS. And, and you will get pro your CPU clock cycle proportionally. So if you double your memory until 2 gigabytes, then the CPU clock cycle will be also doubled. And it will become important. We also can 
provide the timeout. Maximal value is 15 minutes, but uh, just I think the function should be short lived. So uh, we can say, okay, then timeout after X second because something probably went wrong. It can take too long. So this is the way how to configure function. And there are two ways to write the function, which do some business logic. It doesn't matter what. It's uh, just you can, on the left side, you can um, use, uh, you can derive from the request handler from the LWS runtime, so LWS dependency, providing input and output, and then you implement the handler request method. It's the only one method in the interface, just providing the input, which will be automatically serialized from JSON. And then context object is also something provided by the runtime to you. You can uh, look at some, some, some specifics and then just calculate and, and then uh, de deliver the response. On the run side, on the right side is the alternative way where you don't use any um, Amazon SDK, so you derive from, uh, so you implement the function interface from Java 8, and then you implement the method apply. The only difference is that you don't have the context object. And sometimes it's important, many people don't do anything with this, but generally for tracing for other functionalities, it's a possibility to, um, to use this. Now, come back uh, to the cold start. And the best way to explain what it is, is to look at uh, how, how you, what happens when you deploy your function. For example, if you deploy it for the first time and you want to call this function for the first time, the, what you do, you deploy your code. This is some kind of char application. Now, see where you provide this. And if the container or some kind of environment wants to run this function, then your code should be downloaded first. So the, your environment doesn't know the code. It should download this. Then the container should be started. The environment is not Docker container at LWS, it's Firecracker. And then the, your runtime should be bootstrapped. And the runtime is, in this case, is JVM. So what happens in this first step is uh, uh, the LWS Lambda starts the JVM, then Runtime initializes the handler class, so where the business logic sits, so which derives, uh, for, for which implements this uh, handler interface, and then static initializer block on the handler class will be executed. Just normal thing uh, when we load the uh, when we load the Java class, and uh, this static initializer block will receive full CPU access for 10 seconds. So once again, um, if you select only 128 megabytes of memory, will get probably only fraction of the CPU for your business logic. But for, for the static initializer block, you will get the CPU complete full CPU access for 10 seconds. So we can speed up things there and it might be important. So, um, and then the last step is then your code will, will run. And uh, the first three steps, as you see, this is the cold start. So the first invocation is the cold start. Also, if you want to invoke with first try 10 functions in parallel, the container is only allowed to execute one function in the same time. So no, no container will be used for multiple invocation. And that means if you want 10 invocation in parallel and there are no warm containers, then you will experience the code that starts so the containers will be started again, download your code, start container, bootstrap your runtime, all these three steps. And it takes time, we'll look at this. And also, Sometimes the cloud provider releases the container, so they don't guarantee that it will be released forever. People tested this in AWS. They mentioned that after one hour of execution, they will release the container because of security issues and so on. So then you will experience the cold start. So within one hour, if you have a lot of invocations, you will probably have a lot of warm containers and don't experience this this, um, this cold start. But in case you redeploy your function, you will get this for the first call if you uh, have to um, to call multiple uh, multiple times in parallel. So this call start, it also it, there are a lot of dependencies to these, but the, the very first dependency, it depends on your programming language. And this is, there are a lot of statistics, but it's the recent, recently one published, then you see that uh, Java experienced a lot higher call start comparing to JavaScript and Python. Yeah. And, you see nearly one, nearly um, 0 0.8 seconds. And it's probably also one of the reasons why JavaScript and Python uh, um, will be widely used. 
And the truth is that something below one second for the code start duration is only valid for some hello world application. So just with no dependency, simple business logic, simple system out in the land, nothing else, you, you get uh, this code start. So it can significantly go up with more complex scenarios for Java, especially for such programming languages like Java and C Sharp. So if you have dependencies to you know, other open source projects, if you have to install other clients to communicate with other AWS services, and sometimes your Lambda function should do something right to the DynamoDB or to the queue and something else. So that just it increases with the complexity and, and we will talk about the best practices, how to minimize this. But uh, I, I saw the application, the worst case scenario was even higher than 10 or even 20 seconds of the cold start time. And probably if some user will experience this cold start time, just that's not a good thing. So it probably don't wait for the response. And this is what I would say doesn't happen with JavaScript and Python with all these uh, dynamic languages. So. Um, it's really not a very nice situation with these huge cold starts, and uh, but there is a light in the end. And in the same report, um, what uh, what was said is that there are two features currently for AWS, which was provided in the last year, which will improve adoption of Java, and these are provision concurrency and VPC improvement. I think that provision concurrency should be clear, even if you don't have experience with with AWS, the situation is, imagine yeah, there is the nine o'clock in the evening and you send your newsletter to millions of people. So you expect that the people receive this and will click link on that. So if behind this link is some kind of serverless application, then probably you have tons of invocations and probably then the risk of tons of cold starts, which may be 10 seconds. So how you can avoid this? Um, you can provision concurrency in advance. By provision concurrency, you provision your warp containers. And of course, that has a price. So you have to manage this provisioning time. So, you, okay, I will provision five minutes in advance and then at half 10, I don't need all those containers. So just you have to apply some logic to release this. And of course, you pay for all your warm containers for the duration, even if they, you don't need them. So just this is kind of overpay versus cold start. So the same situation we probably have with containers. If you scale too early to start new containers, then you over provision and over pay, or just you can um, probably uh, scale out later. And then just then you also have a risk that the new server should be up and so on. It also takes time to kind of cold start. So this is some kind of balance. You have, you can decide in what situation to apply what. It, Became, becomes difficult if you have dynamic applications, so you don't know your, your peaks. So you don't really know when to provision your concurrency. And one containers, then it then it's, won't solve your problem. And another, um, another improvement, and I can understand that the people that don't have experience with AWS, it might be difficult to understand or more difficult to understand uh, so shortly speaking, um, there is so-called virtual private cloud, some kind of privacy concept in, in, in LWS. And if your Lambda function has to communicate with some services like Elastic Cache, this is managed Elastic Cache service, Elastic Search, this is managed Elk service, and managed relational database, this is RJS cluster, then these three services are, can only be used if they configured, are configured behind the VPC. And this forces you to put your Lambda, so your function as a service, behind the VPC. Just um, to understand that many people love um, relational databases and just uh, don't want to go to the, to the DynamoDB and other things. So, um, uh, but if you have your Lambda behind the VPC, one year ago, you could experience additional cold start of 10 seconds because of the Amazon architecture. We won't deep dive there, but imagine you have the worst case scenario cold start of the VPC and cold start of your Lambda function itself. And then you should add up these cold starts and you will end up probably more than 20, even 30 seconds. No go for, for many applications. So this was improved by Amazon 
and they provided another architecture to scale lambdas behind the PPC. And now this code starts went from 10 seconds to below one second. So just a huge improvement. So now you have to deal only with the code starts of your Lambda function written in your specific programming language. And with one second, you probably can live with this. In case you really need this VPC, sometimes you don't. So now we will go to the improvements which we have to apply um, to, to our Java code to, yeah, to take the most advantage from the serverless application. So the first thing is use Amazon SDK 2.0 for Java. There is the older one, version 1.0. This one is a lot more modular and has also lower footprint. And the most important thing, it allows you to configure your HTTP client. Yeah, that it wasn't possible in the old version. And the situation is, I know that the people love uh, to use Apache HTTP client, native uh, client, and so on. They use caching and so on. This is a good for long living applications, but it's nothing which is really good for serverless functions which are short lived. So you need the simplest possible collection client which makes one communication and then then it's okay. And previously, this standard Java HTTP URL connection client was the best choice. But several months ago, Amazon released its own common uh, assume uh, runtime HTTP client, and you see. Uh, the cold start duration uh, comparison and you see that this uh, just uh, the best choice if you, you need to communicate with the service outside uh, via uh, HTTP client it's really the best choice and reduces um, the cold start by by several seconds alone so this is just probably not very important but this is how you can initialize it um, so this is the first improvement now the second one for the people in LWS it will be known and uh, probably in case not uh, but the situation is you can you build many clients for example you want to communicate with dynamo dbs sqs and so on from your lambda uh, you can you have to build this client yeah so you have the builder library and you can use a lot of defaults there but like region and so on, and credential provider and so on, and let um, Amazon runtime to figure it out. So Amazon can can figure out in what region you deploy. But this takes time. But you know this. You know you are in Europe. You are you know if you are you deploying in US West or you really know what where your credentials are saved. So if you provide all this optional information, it will also reduce the cold start by a second. So just credential provider is the most complex thing. So there are a lot of fallbacks, and this they wrote the whole chain how to figure out uh, uh, to figure out what credentials will be applied. So if you give this object like credential provider implementation, you will save a lot of time in the call start. Um, and what you should do this also in the static initializer um, uh, block. So you don't need to in, 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 in initialize things uh, in the handler method because it will be initialized each time. So move this. To, to the static initializer block and do it once for as long as the container leaves. Um, the next thing is, and it just um, one we mentioned, initialize all your dependencies that you want to use in this static initializer block because you have the access to the full uh, CPU. So you can instantiate things more quickly in this in static initializer block. It's very important. Another optimization is really strange. And I know that it's dirty, and for all Java people, it's really dirty. We hate this. Uh, but if it provides us value, we have to do this. And this um, is the situation that um, it's not sufficient to instantiate client, uh, some Beispiel Amazon DynamoDB client in the static initializer block. So sometimes if we made special calls, like in case of DynamoDB get item or put item where we write something and read something, else only by calling this, the Jackson marshallers will be initialized. And it should, it should be done only one time. And it, this takes also several seconds because the, just the, the cache thing and so on. And if you do this in the handler method, you will experience the call side. If you move this logic, with some fake get item. So just some fake item ID, even if it throws exception, you can catch it. If you move this into the static initializer block, you can do this initialization for the first time 
more quickly and with the full access to the CPU. So this is totally, yeah, just it's not natural thing, but it helps you you to save on this cold start time using the full core. Yes, this is what I mentioned. Only by calling this for the first time, you force your Jackson, Jackson Marshaller to initialize. And also, just this is true for for the serverless world in general. Less dependencies are better. So uh, better for us to so include only required dependencies. So the not the whole dependencies to all services in SDK 2.0, and also exclude dependencies if you don't need this them to run time. So the bigger the package, the more the cold start. It's also known. So just uh, you see the in, in the left side, you include. Uh, the whole uh, first of all you import the scope is import the whole um is decay 2.0 in the middle the, the middle picture says you only Im include dynamodb because your service only communicates with dynamodb so no s3 no sqf everything will be excluded and on the right side you see you provide scope test for j unit stuff and so on what that you don't need in run time so just be as minimalistic as possible because it saves you on cold start and also saves you on performance. And you will see also it saves you money. So I know this is a lot of information. Some, sometimes, okay, this is just a bit strange for me, but just, yeah, the people currently finding for solutions to, to make Java more accessible and serverless. And sometimes um, the solutions are a bit just not what we learned uh, during our career. Um, another thing is just, yeah, what we have to avoid is reflection because reflection means also just it costs us performance. It also costs us memory because every method invocation on reflection, every field that we try to access with reflection will be cached. That means just also memory. And we'll be talking memory is also money. Also runtime by generation, runtime generate proxies, dynamic class loading. Those are all things which will... Uh, slow down uh, your application and just slow down your function and just probably you ask how, I, how how can I accomplish this? I use Spring and just Spring relies on all this stuff which which is in this slide and Juice also and yeah that's why we will be talking about other frameworks like Micronaut, Quarkus, Dega is just we won't talk about Dega but Dega is also not that reflection based so just there are other solutions which make other trade-offs for the serverless world. But generally speaking, if you would like to be productive with core spring, as we know it, and we will apply it in the serverless world, just uh, we will be productive writing the code, but that, that, that won't provide the performance and probably our bill will be a bit too much for us. The next point, it's probably now time to talk uh, the money. So we have to strive for the cost optimization and that's why we have to understand our bill and our bill at AWS. It's probably not this, not that difficult um, how Lambda is priced. So there are two tiers, request tier. So how much uh, times we call our Lambda function, it doesn't depend on the programming language. So just we can't ignore this. And the duration tier, how much time does the function execute and it's very much dependent on the um, on the programming language we know that java is fast in the execution but this call time uh, this uh, uh, call start is just also one parameter so uh, per request you pay 20 cents for million requests and you pay this amount uh, for gigabyte of memory per second used which is simple concept so what if your lambda takes one second and you assigned one gigabyte of memory even if you used less memory if you assigned one gigabyte you will pay for one gigabyte and for the actual duration of the function so one second one gigabyte means this price just simple calculation we have one million lambda with one million requests and we assigned half of the uh, gigabytes memory and each lambda forget about cold starts for the simplicity takes 118 milliseconds it will be rounded to, to the next 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. So this is how Amazon builds. And then we can um, calculate the tiers request tier and then also the duration tier. So you see the pricing for, uh, for this computation. Uh, another question is, OK, if I assign more memory, so instead of 128 megabytes, I will double this. Uh, 
will the cost also scale with memory? And the question and the answer is no, because you will get also double as much CPU cycles if you double the memory. And the dub, double the, doubling the CPU cycle also means your program will be executed quicker. So probably you may pay even less with the double of memory. But the question is, how can I, um, how can I find out the most, yeah, the, 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 how much memory should I assign? And there is so-called lambda power tuning. It comes from people from LWS itself. They have some kind of state machine. They will they, they test your function with different different configurations with different memory configurations, and uh, and then provide you the best uh, price performance result. Um, so my experience is that uh, you will receive this result with half of, or even with half of the gig of memory or with the gig of memory. So just uh, making fun. Uh, function to use a very sm small amount of memory just uh, it's not always the best solution but it may depend or depend on use case and then use this power tuning uh, tool to um, to figure out what's the best uh, for me just we could probably uh, go through that and the question that sometimes people ask I would like to use Java 15 or Java 14 and just it won't be possible as I mentioned because only long term versions will be supported is it possible generally not but um uh, there is the the project uh, fr gal from uh, tony apple probably people know him uh, from as german speaking guy and what he provides and i probably won't recommend you to use this live but <laughs> this is some kind of interesting thing so just this project provides you the possibility to produce bytecode currently from java 14 um uh, bytecode of, of GDK 8 or even 11, and then you can deploy it to the LWS function. And what does it mean? So you can use features there which uh, don't require bytecode change. And uh, from all features between 9 and 14, only modules and records require uh, the bytecode change. So you can use them, but var, text, block, switch expressions, instance of, and so on, this is perfectly. Um, Possible, so you can enjoy also the newer releases if you will. If you, this makes you productive, you can test if it's something for you. But generally speaking, um, very nice uh, project. So this is how to do this. Just import this dependency on the left side to. Um, uh, so just define that the uh, um, compiler is just org fgral compiler, and then define compiler ID as fgral, and then. Just define source and target. So from 14 to to 8 or even to 11, it's perfectly possible. So just you can deploy this to LWS, and then use Maven clean install. So the, the same commands as, as usual. So just you switch the compiler to fgraph. So generally speaking, um, Java is, as language was always optimized for long running server application, and uh, of course with we will live with high start times and high memory utilization. Just that was okay. And you've seen that both start time times because it increases your duration and also high memory utilization mean, or the, in the case of memory utilization, it may mean that you will pay more for serverless. So just this, um, uh, these trade-offs are not very well fitted for, for the serverless world. Uh, even if you do all these optimizations, which we discuss, it will probably end up with just a bit higher um, call start times and and just uh, pay more. So now GraalVM enters the scene, and we won't talk about the GraalVM in general. You probably have had a lot of talks to this topic. Um, what's important for me? Yeah, you have. Um, Two editions, community edition and enterprise edition. With enterprise edition, you will you will pay for this, but you will receive more performance. So some edge edge case imp, uh, performance improvements, or you use Oracle um, Cloud, then you will get um, I think enterprise edition for free. And um, what's important there that the architecture, um, how you do this, just some words. So you have this Java JVM compiler interface from Java 8 and the ground compiler on top of this, then you can use all JVM based languages like Java, Kotlin, Scala, Groovy, and, and so on. Then there's a truffle framework, but this is all everything out of scope. 
for today, what's the important is this, the most important part is the substrate VM. And what this substrate VM gives us, this is a kind of head, ahead of time compiler, uh, which pro, uh, allows you to build the native image. And it works like every um, ahead of time compiler. It looks for all reachable methods, fields, and classes, and uh, does the static analysis. And uh, with the ahead of time compilation, then the um, machine code will be uh, native code will be produced like LF for Linux, Mac, or Mac, and there is also the version for Windows uh, currently. So now um, it looks like just this is the comparison Graal VM on hotspot and Graal VM on substrate VM. Now you see that even Java will be natively precombined with some basic threading, garbage collection, and so on. This is the difference if you have substrate VM. And of course, uh, if you compile your native executable, with Graal VM on substrate VM, then you reduce hugely your code start time. So just native images are very, very fast to start. So this is probably something which will be below 100 millisecond, and uh, which is really fine. So if you look at the uh, code starts of JavaScript and 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 and, and uh, Python, then it's very much comparable or compatible. And of course, you have the low memory footprint because. Only things that are reachable, they use, will be packed into the native image. And what also native image does, it's pre-initialize all static initializer. And that's sometimes very important. Um, um, so just you save also on this. And yeah, this cold start times, memory footprint, if you improve there, then you improve your, yeah, your performance and also your bill in the cloud. And just some kind of goal, of course, with trade-offs, and we will be talking about this. Everything is a trade-off. But the situation is with Graal VM is that you can select Graal VM, it's separate runtime. So you can select Java 8, you can select Java 11 as a managed runtime at AWS, but you can select Graal VM. And uh, I think it's true for, for all cloud providers, but what you can do, you can provide with a, a, Amazon gives you the possibility to provide your custom runtime. So not the managed runtime like Python, Java, so your custom runtime. And this is kind of door opener, there is so-called Lambda layers and the Lambda runtime API, which allow you to do this. And what you are doing is simply building your native image and um, custom runtime only works with Linux executables. This is, this is very important. And what you do in the below, you see this, you package this runtime as function zip. And uh, there you have this bootstrap file. This bootstrap um, file will, will be your native executable built with GraalVM. So this is the possibility to, to pack your GraalVM and provide this as a, as a custom runtime. Of course, if you manage your own runtime, then you have to take care of this just in case of uh, Java 8 and 11, Amazon takes care for you or other cloud providers. So just there are some trade-offs, but currently it's not solvable in AWS world anyway not, but this is the possibility to, to do this. So people can provide even Docker runtimes and so on, but for ours, it's the possibility to, to package our function in state. So GraalVM gives you the choice. So you can use just-in-time compiler if you will, just or, ahead of time compiler, so you decide what to do. And of course, everything has a trade-off. As you see, ahead of time compiler is optimized for, for the start speed, for low memory, for low memory footprint and small packaging. And these are the characteristics where we, are, yeah, that you benefit with the serverless application. Just in time compiler uh, provides benefits for the peak throughput and reduced maximal latency. So this is kind of long-lived uh, server application. Of course, you have another downtime with ahead of time compiler because the compilation into native image takes time. My experience is something between two and three minutes just to compile a simple function currently. Yeah, will, will be improved, but this is not that something happens in within the seconds, even for the very small hello world function. But generally, you see ahead of time compiler brings a lot of benefits for the serverless application. Also, just even if we told that the function may live within container for one hour, then the container will be released anyway. So just of the whole JVM thing will be released. 
But even for one hour, we would like to have all these optimizations because we, we can call the function probably 10,000 of times. So just we would like to have some optimization like just in time compiler does after 10,000 invocations optimize something which is not available uh, within GraalVM per default. But you have this profile guided optimization feature which kind of do this optimization on the fly uh, to reduce the latency. But uh, as you see, it's only available in the enterprise edition currently. So just then you have to pay for this. Um, so I didn't try this out, but just they also experiment with this to have probably other trade-offs for, for the function which live longer. So we will talk very briefly about these frameworks um, which, uh, which provide the, the support of um, GraalVM. So you can enjoy kind of model like we know the spring annotation based and so on and uh, as you see even the spring now has the GraalVM native image support project just experimental but there are also frameworks like Quarkus Micronode which were built uh, for microservices and also serverless application in mind and they were designed from the ground up differently so just um, and the common principles for especially for Quarkus and, and, and Micronode are relying on as little reflection as possible. Avoid runtime bytecode generation, runtime generated proxies, dynamic class loading. So as much as possible, don't use all this stuff. So process annotation at compile time because just it also costs money and you can result in, in the compile time, but it takes longer. And just they have the common goal to speed up uh, start times and, and decrease memory usage for microservices and serverless Java application. And what's important is this this is true for using GraalVM as native image support or even without native image. So if you simply write your application with Micronaut and deploy it, you will uh, probably reduce the cold start if you compare this uh, with the application if you write with the play, play in Spring. So you will of course, without all these annotations, you will you can write plain Java programs, but you will probably lose your productivity. And this is some kind of the way in between. So you have the productivity with this just all these annotations and so on. Um, and uh, but they also do many things uh, differently uh, for the serverless world. So it's probably not very important. Um, you can you will receive the links in the end, so you can try things out. So uh, for our demos at AWS, what is important, you install your application of the choice, which is every application. You need GraalVM and native image support for your operating system. Deploy separator, you need Maven or Gradle. I'm the Maven guy. And you need some AWS tools for local and testing or the tools which will ease the deployment. And then you can use, um, you can then develop and then you can build your Linux executable just uh, with GraalVM native image and there are plugins through these frameworks and then you deploy your Linux executable as a custom runtime as we have told uh, several minutes ago packed into the function zip as Linux executable. So this is if you use a serverless application model from AWS just I don't know how many people use this, this is how it looks like as you see a runtime is provided this means custom runtime you see function zip after you have built this and handler method just uh, there is no handler method, it's a uh, native image. So that's probably for the people who, are, who know, who have experience there, this is the way you can deploy this. Um, or you can do this manually via console uh, for testing purposes. And so on, we will very briefly go for, uh, through the application, for, through the frameworks and the, the combination with GraalVM. You can use this also without GraalVM, as I told you. And the first framework is Micronode. Just People who are familiar with Spring, just very easy and understandable to use. And Oracle and Google support uh, these frameworks, just the version 2.0. So you can use this. And if you define your Lambda function, you see we can implement function interface. So there's really not too much dependency on Micronode framework. You see only the functional bit. This is the only annotation uh, <clears throat> which, uh, which we use from Micronode itself. Otherwise, it's completely business logic. We can also write tests for this, so we can define interface client and just annotate this with the Micronode function client. Um, 
annotation and then the proxy for implementation will be generated. On the left side, you see the test where we annotate with the micronode test and then we inject the client so the implementation will be injected and uh, we can inject our, yeah, so with the client we can do our call. So uh, there is no demo app currently under the windows. What's very nice with micronodes, so it provides custom validation. You have also provide your API gateway so you can do some public facing um, call, just lambda behind the API gateway. But what I really like, if you are very, very familiar with Spring, you can even write your Spring, use Spring annotation, and then you see on the right side, you can use the annotation processor, processor from Micronode, and it can uh, really, uh, it understands the Spring annotation. So it converts uh, everything at compile time to Micronode application. Just not recommendable, but you can do this if you have the existing application and you don't want to rewrite this. It understands very, very many annotations from Spring. On the left side, you see just uh, um, you have other annotation processors from the Micronode itself, and uh, the only only dependency uh, to LWS, you see this implements Micronode function LWS. It's the only dependency at, at compile time to, 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 to Lambda functions. Currently, there is Gradle play plugin available to build native image with, with Gradle. Maven plugin is in the works. Just I also talked with people, they said it will be there. Otherwise, you have you, you can use the native command for yourself. So you build your jar, then you can use your um, native image to build this, and then you have to pack this into function zip and re rename the native image to bootstrap and so on. Just um, it's currently the only one framework which doesn't provide Maven plugin. What's very interesting is that the founder is very known. This is Graham Rocher, and you know probably Groovy and Grails. He is also the founder there. And it, he has recently joined Oracle, and Oracle is one of the sponsors of, of Micronaut, uh, uh, along with the Google. So probably we will see even more support from Oracle. And just, I really like this, this model uh, from, uh, from Micronaut, and it really uses as much, as little reflection as possible. There really is no reflection in many parts, and it's really lightweight. So for me, it's currently the, the framework of my choice, but I, you can convince yourself. The Quarkus is just the alternative one, and just from Red Hat and IBM, and the thing is completely the same. So just it's another use another annotations. Now we implement from request handler. We can use also a function interface. Just you see the lambda function. You don't see anything there from uh, from Quarkus in the implementation itself, and just. The same thing, you can write the test. Now you annotate this with the Quarkus test annotation and just bit, just another programming model. So you use Lambda client, this is the implementation also from Quarkus, and then you do your invocation. So just a bit different if you write test, the business logic looks <clears throat> the same. What I really like about uh, Quarkus is that there is a possibility to build native images. Already said with, with Maven plugin, you see um, profile native, and then you say goal is native image, and then just you use Maven as a profile minus p native package. So um, very, very easy. And then you can use also other goals to zip your native image so and name it to function uh, zip. So just you don't need to do anything, then, then you're completely ready for, for the AWS world. Um, as far as I know, you have to use command line to build your application with um, Micronaut. With the Quarkus, there is the website for creating the app like <coughs> Spring I.O. or Spring Initializer I.O. So um, people familiar with Spring will, will, will see the same thing there. Also API gateway support, so we can provide the API for the public usage. And then uh, there is a programming model, a model behind it. And there is also funky support. And funky support is for the people who believe or think that multi-cloud is solution for them. So just because of the company policies and so on, they have to be ready to deploy into AWS Lambda, Azure function, even on k -Nate. For them, they will provide some basic support for AWS Lambda. 
So you have one programming model and then we'll generate the, the code for you. So you don't have to take care about this and just you can um, simply uh, switch your lambdas between cloud providers. Um, this is currently in beta what they write that you will have to sacrifice many features of your cloud provider. So I personally don't believe on multi-cloud. Yeah, it's not the use case in our company probably, but uh, I think it's really difficult alone the knowledge of one cloud provider it requires a huge effort in the company. So I, it must be a huge company which can which uses two of them or some kind of Canative and, and, and cloud provider. So um, probably for the small companies, the multi-cloud is not the way and probably then the funky won't bring anything there. And then if you use multi-cloud, you can use specific um, manage services like DynamoDB and so on because you can't port that easily and you can't simply yeah some kind of port your your storage and your permission model and so on so just a lot of challenges for the multi-cloud world because all providers have um, differences so yeah, Quarkus Funky support for Lambda and API Gateway and I think they support also Azure but I didn't test this just in case this is for you, you can follow uh, when it will leave the beta state. And of course, there is a Spring framework, a Spring Boot framework. And probably many people love this. I also just developed probably more than 10 years with this, but even more, I think. And just, yeah, that's super. But you know, the Spring is heavily based on annotations. And just, it's not the most performant framework. And of course, just if you use this for the serverless world, you will see all the downsides of this. And of course, the Spring developers, the, so the Spring, the Spring, the company behind Spring, they of course want to give um, also native experience, Gradient native experience to, to the people uh, so that they can use Spring with serverless. So they started Gradient native project, but I think one and a half year ago, so just months after uh, Quarkus and Micronaut, and of course, uh, now they, they have to, to refactor a lot of code to just to make this uh, possible, just to use uh, all this, uh, yeah, to, to just free from the reflection and so on. And of course, if you look at the current metrics, um, uh, how much time does it take to start the application? How much memory does it use and so on? So this depends on the day that you test and the version, but I would say Quarkus and Micronaut are very similar. Um, uh, if you look at the metrics in Spring, currently is behind. Yeah, they started later and they have, of course, the two other frameworks was designed from the ground up differently in the Spring. Uh, they have to refactor a lot. Of. So just, um, but generally speaking, uh, you can use your familiar um, programming model. Here's also example where you implement function interface and you use your auto wired annotation and so on. Just our familiar Spring model, but what's currently dif different? Spring requires you to use demo application as a client, so you as an application um, class. And you see the first annotation: Spring put application in proxy bin methods false. Currently, you have to use this. And what does it say? Graal VM supports only GTK proxy, and default they in the Spring world is I think CGLib. So just uh, with the with this annotation, you will switch to to GDK proxy and you see that you have to initialize your bins below and it's a bit of repetitive business logic for me just to initialize all these bins and sometimes you will have many of them. So that's what um, Micronaut and Quarkus don't have. So I, I think that Spring will improve and also we will get rid of this code, but currently it's necessary to have this application. And then just the same thing as with Quarkus, there is a native plugin um, in Graal, Graal plugins or to, to build the native image out of, out of the box. And you can even tune it with build arguments or additional build arguments. So just in case that the people experiment with a native image of Graal VM, they probably will, uh, will understand all those annotations. So uh, this is a very good thing, just also possible. But um, as I told you, it's early to use Spring Framework. So comparison. I won't do it because uh, just I'm only focused on, 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 on the serverless part. But of course, there are also frameworks to, to be used in the microservices world and not, not, not especially for the serverless world. And then you can take a look at initialization and programming model, database support, test support. 
so what are the benefits uh, and so on. What is important for me um, in the serverless world is how to compare, we have to look at the metrics for the plane framework and the, if I use native image. So, um, and, and just the metrics are very similar. So just you, probably in the native image, you have your build time as additional metrics and then you have your native image size comparing to the application size. So these are the metrics to look at and they've already told you Spring is currently way behind and Micronaut and Quarkus are, I would say, comparable. Uh, so conclusion, uh, so GraalVM and frameworks, especially Quarkus and, and, and Micronaut, really powerful and they have a lot of potential and I think it's a good match between this framework and also Spring uh, GraalVM project and GraalVM native image itself. So as already mentioned, if you use Micronaut and Quarkus, even without uh, GraalVM, it will improve your st cold start time and it will give you the productivity you, you are familiar with Spring. Um, yeah, you know this, just you, they use as little as possible um, uh, of uh, reflection and uh, cold start duration will depend if you use GraalVM just uh, 100 milliseconds and so, and you don't use GraalVM native image, only several seconds, depending on how you do this. Um, and But if you use the combination of frameworks and GraalVM native, there are a lot of challenges. Still a lot of challenges. The first one, uh, AWS requires Linux executable, so the Windows and, and Mac people will probably have to use Docker. Okay, managing the custom runtimes requires some additional effort on your side, so just all the scripting, all the CI CD pipelines to build it, it's important. Uh, delivering execution runtime, like Java, if you use managed runtime, and you will deliver the same runtime um, uh, with custom runtime, custom runtime will be always a bit slower because there is this, this is the, there is the API in between, this invocation will cost you a bit. So just, you will, you will be a bit penalized uh, with, it, with, the, with the performance if you use custom runtime, it will always be. And there are a lot of exceptions. If you build things for the first time and you use GraalVM, just there are a lot of exceptions uh, which you have to deal with. Uh, and just the link below how to resolve the common problems on the Stack Overflow, I used it, and just helped me a lot. And you have to experiment with a lot of flex. Depending on your dependencies, does initialize at runtime or delay class initialization to runtime, these are the flex which um, which you use often and sometimes it's really boring because what you would like to do is to, to build native image of the very simple function with as little as possible dependencies and just it doesn't work out of the box. You have to, 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 to Google things just to, to look at the stack overflow and so on. And of course the people who would like um, to test quickly, then they have to wait on this um, uh, whole uh, native image stuff. So, and once again, less dependencies are more. So just try to avoid and, and, and use dependencies because they force you to use all these GraalVM flags because there is some class which, be, which you don't need at all and it causes you problems and so on. So minimize the things. So just don't use dependencies and then throw them one by one if you really need, need them into your, yeah, into your uh, Maven. So if you would like to try it by yourself, there are a lot of links with, with the examples for AWS world. I have divided them by, by frameworks. And the last point is Michelinius there, the AWS lab itself um, provides one example for with all three frameworks within this. So just you can take a look and just uh, try it out. It's very, very easy if you, if you are familiar with AWS cloud and how to deploy this. And everything is automated. And the last, probably the last thing to mention, this is so-called Project Layden, which which was announced for discussion. This is so-called call for discussion in the end of April by um, um, by by Oracle. And um, what you see by Mike Rein by Mark Reinold. So what they would love to do is to provide this native uh, image. Um, feature to the Java world itself. So if you, so that you can use it with the Open GDK, for example. Yeah? Um, there were discussion if it uh, will replace uh, GraalVM, the answer was no. It would be surprising because uh, Oracle tends to make money with GraalVM. So 
I don't really know how they will both differentiate because it's probably too early and it will take years to see the results. Uh, as far as I understood, this project should provide the common APIs, which GraalVM also should use, but it's not the goal to replace GraalVM. And just imagine it will be there. It will be much easier for currently for the developers if they can use native image functionality of the managed runtime. So you don't have to use GraalVM and don't, you don't have to provide your custom runtime. So you can use runtime, manage runtime Java and then use um, uh, this native image functionality. So this is that will remove this dependency to the custom runtime that will make things easier and just you and, and, and also quicker. Uh, so that's it what I wanted to tell you. So I hope it wasn't very boring, especially for the people who did, uh, don't have much experience with serverless or AWS cloud. Just if you have the experience with other cloud providers, use the same frameworks. They are universal. There is no dependency to AWS itself. So you can uh, for sure try them out in, within your public cloud provider, OK, native, and so on. So just stay tuned. I think that we are in the beginning of this, and it will come more. Uh, we will see more of GraalVM and so on. So thank you very much. And I will be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much for your talk. and. Uh, we have a few questions, not much, but a few, and uh, you can still add your questions in the Q&A tab on the right side of the chat tab. Please enter your questions there. there. The first question is, do you know whether the Java 8 and 11 runtime have different code start times on AWS? Interesting question. Just uh, I haven't compared this, um, so I can't answer this. Uh, we use uh, mostly Java 8, so I don't have too much experience with Java 11, uh, so I can't answer this, but you can probably you can build this application with the links uh, I gave you, and then you can um, just without GraalVM native image and, and, and simply choose different runtimes and, 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 and run your benchmarks for your own. But that's a nice question. I will, will take it. And uh, if I have a three minutes, so I just can can test this. I don't expect too much improvement on Java 11. So if you think the Java 11 will improve this, uh, I will probably say no. I saw the metrics, the similar metrics for FN project. And probably you know this is just kind of fu function as a service solution, yeah, which Oracle uh, provides. And as far as I know, and I've, I was at JCon two years ago, and David Delebasi talked about this and, 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 and um, he mentioned that it got even worse um, with Java 11 because they made some optimization and they wanted to improve this. So there are some things which made they made could make this uh, code start even, even worse. And I hope this is kind of, uh, of fixed, um, but generally I don't think it will be much faster or even faster. Maybe Java 6 might be uh, rather fast today, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, you cannot use this in. <laughs> I think it's a, a, a good thing because I just how many years Java six is not supported for probably twelve or something like this. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, the next question is: uh, How about your experience with GraalVM in real life production scenarios? Uh, so we don't have this in real life production scenarios. So we have. I have tried uh, this with the small application, but without using native image. I currently don't feel myself very comfortable. So just I know that it's, it's fun to uh, to test with this, but I'm currently struggling to do something in production for uh, I would say some workloads which um, uh, which which are really sensitive. Uh, the reason for this is because I don't very like uh, custom runtime. It's 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 a huge overhead for me. So just I would like to use Micronaut and just plain Java 11, and then just uh, just package this and uh, don't use GraalVM currently in production custom runtime. So I've shown the ways because we experiment. We we have also to be ready in case just we see a lot of productivity gain, um, but. Uh, I'm currently 
just also waiting for for, for the improvement and so on. Yeah. So you prefer Micronaut? Yeah. Personally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and the last question is, how do you run your lambdas at work? With native image? If not, why not already? I probably I answered the question that we don't use GraalVM, so that's why also not so plain. Um, the reason is, as I mentioned, uh, custom runtime, um, just, uh, just this Linux executables and so on, and this also performance loss. If you compile the things, and some, the functions are very small, so you would like to compile this and test this um, locally very quickly. And this led me, for example, to test the function without native image uh, because it's quicker. But if you then deploy this with the um, native image, so you just some kind of it feels like differently. So just I would like to test the function the same way I deploy and run the function. And just currently this waiting time is really unusual. Um, so just uh, probably we have, everybody has to rethink and everything is a trade-off. So just of course it's a question, do we want to save on, on, on money and, 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 and to win on performance? Uh, if you put this in production, then you have to sacrifice your local testing performance. And just uh, it's the thing which is very difficult currently just to switch off and, and say, okay, locally, I don't need to test this. I have to wait for minutes. Um, but probably it's a way to go if this uh, uh, native image building will improve that we will be below one, one second, then we will probably start using it uh, more. Thank you very much. Uh, as I can see, there are no more questions. Perfect. So, well, uh, first, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, as always, everyone who has a presentation at the Java user group will get one of these nice Swiss knives with Java user group branding. Oh, the Swiss knife, okay. Yeah, it's a, tool, it's a lot of tools. Of course, you won't get this one. You get a new one. A brand new one. Thank you very much, Marcus, also for the invitation. And yeah. if anyone else want this uh, such a knife, you have to do a talk at the Java user group. So please contact us and uh, using Slack or email, our website, whatever. And we are happy to organize something with you. Uh, there are a few more events soon, as you can see here on the slide. It's about a JBang and about Eclipse microprofile. A third event about the art of software reviews. We unfortunately had to cancel because it was uh, an on-site event in Zurich. And as you know of the actual situation, well, we are canceling the on-site event there in Zurich, but our online events continue and we hope next year will be a much better year for all of us. Well, I told you, we want you. So if you have a talk, if you want such a really cool knife with a lot of tools, please contact us and we organize something. And if you uh, have an idea for a talk or a topic or a speaker you want to recommend, please contact us too. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, when I close now this webinar, you will be forwarded to our feedback form on the Java user group uh, website. And please fill out this feedback form. These informations are very important for us. So thank you, Vadim. Thank you, all the attendees. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.